So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this NGA webinar on planning for September and beyond. My name is Steve Edmonds. I'm NGA's Director of Advice and Guidance, and I, it's a pleasure to welcome you uh, this afternoon. There's much I want to cover with you in a very short time, actually, that I have available to you. And so if you see me glancing down at my notes or even picking them up, it's just because I don't want to overlook something that I think is really important to share. I welcome your questions and comments throughout the webinar, so feel free to submit those using the usual functionality. Uh, I'll get to them at the end of the webinar and explain how we're going to respond to some of those questions and comments through our usual NGA guidance and frequently asked question routes. So hopefully that, uh, that sets the scene and uh, let's crack on, shall we? Because today, is a very significant day, as uh, as I'm sure you all know by now, and as I attempt to move my slide on, uh, the government has published its guidance for all schools on how uh, they are able to open at full capacity from September, whilst reducing the risk of COVID-19 infection. Uh, many of you will have heard uh, the Secretary of State address the House this morning on this matter, and I'm sure that you'll be tuning in later to the government press conference uh, you may or may not yet have had the opportunity to engage with the guidance and familiarise yourself with exactly what's in it. Uh, I encourage you to do that because I think it's really important for us as governors and trustees to have that level of understanding to inform those conversations that we'll be having with our school leaders up to the end of term and indeed early in September. So I certainly encourage you uh, encourage you to do that. And in terms of what's in the guidance, um, it really does set out the task ahead, particularly for the next three weeks. There is an immense amount to be done uh, and only three weeks before the end of term. Frankly, we needed this advice sooner, we needed this guidance sooner, but we are where we are. And in broad terms and in terms that we can all relate to, irrespective of our governing structure and our school structure, and taking into account those really important employment responsibilities that we have, and indeed the overall level of accountability. This is what lies ahead for us over the next three weeks. Our school leaders, now that they have the guidance, will be revisiting their risk assessments, their control measures and their operational plans. They'll be seeking our advice as governing boards on those revised documents and those revised operational plans. We will be testing the quality of the decision making that sits beneath uh, those plans and, and assessments at the same time as offering a very important listening ear and offering to support the implementation in the best way we can given our respective roles and responsibilities. But more than anything, we'll be working as a team together with our school leaders to build the confidence in our school communities that what we are doing, what we intend to do to bring our schools back to full capacity is safe, is feasible and is thought through. And uh, that's going to be very important uh, that we do reach out to those people who are understandably concerned, our parents and our staff, about the health and safety implications of meeting this government ask. So it is a real challenge over the next three weeks. It's not something that I am uh, going to try and underplay during this webinar. I realise that many of you will have your anxieties about it, but I also know that in the spirit of ethical leadership and positive implementation, uh, that you will proceed uh, and try to do uh, the right thing uh, for, your, for your pupils. Now, I can't um, unfortunately deal with every a uh, particular query that you might have, or indeed concern that you might have about aspects of the guidance. I just haven't got the time available, and frankly, I'm still coming to terms with it myself. So what I really want to do, which I think will be more useful uh, for this webinar, is to provide you as governors and trustees, because I'm, I'm a governor and trustee myself, with an aid memoir for those really important conversations that will be taking place with our school leaders over the next three weeks, and indeed, at the beginning of September into the autumn term. And three topics that provide that aid memoir. First of all, there is the resilient and the flexible planning uh, that needs to happen to, to 
bring schools back to full capacity in September. So what are we doing in our school to make that happen? Uh, and what are our options? And then um, we'll, we'll link that to the recovery strategy um, and how we reframe our strategic priorities for the next year or period ahead to ensure that this very traumatic experience that we've been through as a society doesn't create a damaging legacy for our school or trust. And then we look at the way that we'll do our governing business from September. Now that we've had uh, this experience of governing virtually or pretty much forced on us really unexpectedly, what do we want to keep doing though? What do we want to adapt as a result of what we've been through? And what do we need to stop doing? So I'll try to touch on, on that, but this is really a, an aid memoir, I hope, uh, more than a, a really um, detailed uh, unpicking of, of the guidance. I just wanted to really try and empower you to have meaningful conversations in your own, uh, in your own context. And let's, uh, shall we, look a little bit more uh, at those discussions that we'll be having this, this term with our school leaders because the last couple of meetings or the last meeting of the academic year, they're usually reflective experiences, aren't they? They're the opportunity for us to evaluate, look at performance data and take a strategic considered view on the direction that our school and trust is heading in based on, based on performance, what that means in terms of our strategy and what that means for us uh, in terms of strategy development. This year is a bit different. The final meetings of the academic year, the next three weeks will be dominated uh, more than anything about how we as a school or trust can implement and engage with this government guidance in a way that allows us to bring uh, us back to full capacity, how we can do that in the safest way possible for our pupils and our staff, how we can safeguard them from the threat of COVID when they're in school and at the same time as offering a full a broad and balanced curriculum and all the logistical challenges that comes with that so we'll also be engaging in our own way and on our own terms and in our own context with this national guidance that's been published today and it's really important to sort of say that and, and remember that it is just guidance and uh, what you won't have and what we don't have is a detailed blueprint or plan for bringing back all our pupils in our context. If you think the guidance will provide you with that, uh, or any guidance can provide you with, with the answers to all your individual questions, then you're going to be disappointed, probably quite frustrated and angry too. So I think it's best to come to terms with what guidance can achieve for you at a very early stage, because it allows us to move on then and think about planning and, and the flexibility that the guidance affords us and that we can we can adopt our, ourselves because flexibility is going to be very much the byword over the next um, few weeks. We need to think about our own circumstances, but also about different things that may happen, different scenarios um, that may occur and, and what we would do in those situations, one of which would be um, a high rate of infection in our, in our locality and, and indeed the prospect of a, of a local lockdown. And I, I should say at this, uh, at this point uh, that our hearts go out to the people of Leicester at this time and, and all the difficulties that they're, they're, they're experiencing. We wish them well. Uh, and sadly, it, it's likely to be the case that they won't be the only locality, the only region that, that um, experiences a local lockdown in the, coming, in the coming months. That's just where we are, I think in terms of our fight against this dreadful disease. So we need to be mindful of that and our planning options need to bear those kind of things in mind. And whilst our focus perhaps before the end of term, before the summer break, is to uh, implement the guidance in the safest possible way and, and to risk assess and, and plan control measures, um, we're also, we can't detach that aspect from the recovery phase, from how from September we start to help our pupils, staff and school community come to terms with what's happened to them over the last few weeks, understand better what's happened to them uh, over the last few weeks and indeed help them recover, uh, they recover their lost learning, 
recover their confidence, recover their uh, emotional health and well-being. So that recovery phase, although perhaps we'll, we, those conversations will pick up from September, they'll certainly have begun and you'll start to be thinking about them now. Um, so it is um, a very uh, significant uh, ask uh, of, of governing boards, school leaders uh, and everyone involved uh, for the remainder of this term. And as a governor and a trustee myself, as a chair of a governing board, uh, I don't really have any, any more complicated uh, or binary success criterion than what you see on this slide here. With the schools that I'm associated with by the end of term, uh, I would hope that we know as far as possible, given what's in the guidance, what our individual schools options are that we have sat down or had some level of engagement and discussion about the risk assessments and control measures uh, that need to be put in place to achieve that safe return to full capacity, that we have started to and are continuing to reach out to our staff and their representatives and our stakeholders to listen to their concerns and also uh, explain how we intend to respond, to respond and link to that, uh, they will be, there will be our, our communication, uh, particularly our communication to, set, uh, to parents about what we will be doing from, from September to return to full capacity, what they need to do to support us to return, that, to, return to full capacity in a safe way and how school will be different uh, from September. So by the end of term, those things I would like to think are in train and are happening so that we can achieve what uh, what we've been asked to what we've been asked to achieve uh, and that's you know that that's very important and that's that's a success criterion and that's that's what I will be thinking about when I'm having my conversations with the board and with school leaders those are the things are, that I'll be bearing in mind and also I won't be overlooking um, the summer holidays either and this summer period which is now right upon us uh, and, and can't come soon enough for school leaders and staff who've been absolutely full on for the last three months in the most difficult circumstances. They are exhausted, they need a rest. That is a national conversation at the moment uh, and, and as board members we're acutely aware of that and there is no requirement for schools to remain open over the summer. That was uh, a possibility uh, at one point or certainly seemed to be the case but it, it is not, not a requirement. Um, but as, as governors and trustees, we, we don't take for granted or underplay the significance of summer provision to so many families and young people up and down the country. And the summer provision that perhaps we're used to or, or our, our locality and schools sector provides uh, may not be available um, this summer because of COVID, because of the impact that COVID has had. And, and so there may be some real gaps in summer provision that could have uh, an even greater and profound impact on those families and young people who rely on them. And whilst there is funding for summer activity programmes and national funding hasn't been increased significantly, perhaps to take into account the fact that those, those gaps have emerged. So at the same time that we're having conversations about returning to full capacity in September, we're also remembering to, to think and discuss the summer holiday period and what's possible for our school and trust to do on behalf of families and young people at the same time as looking after our staff. So can we use our catch-up funding, the £650 million that was announced a couple of weeks ago and that has been distributed uh, amongst schools? Can we use that? Can we budget for that, even though we've not got the money yet to, to um, increase provision or uh, provide provision in some way that would help or is there a, a, are there conversations or are there opportunities to reach out to local partners, authorities, third sector bodies to see if we can uh, provide something for our pupils uh, based on what we think is needed for them and the gaps uh, that may have uh, you know have arisen as a result of uh, as a result of Covid and the world changing so for the next three weeks, uh, those board level conversations will be dominated uh, by these, these very strategic uh, planning conversations. And what I'd like to do really uh, is 
is to hear from you uh, about your likely engagement in this planning process now that the guidance is published. So I have a simple polling question uh, for you. Uh, and it's this, is your, now the, now the guidance is published on, on returning to full capacity, is your, is your board due to meet or does it have a mechanism for, for discussing uh, and reviewing the planning and risk assessment options for returning to full capacity in September? So there are four options there for you. And just as I go through them, I'm going to ask my colleague Molly to open the poll, if that's okay, Molly. Um, the first option is yes, we have a meet, meeting scheduled over the next three weeks. The second option is no, we don't have a meeting scheduled, but now the guidance is published. We, I expect a meeting will, will happen. The third option is no, I don't think we will be meeting or having a board level discussion, but we will wait to be informed by our school or trust leader on what exactly the uh, plans are. And the fourth, which is always the option I hope least of you select, is that um, you don't know or, or you feel in the dark about actually what's happening uh, in your school uh, through these COVID times and indeed uh, in, 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 the, in the September phase or the phase from September when we're expected to return uh, to full capacity. So those, those are the four options and, and I've used that uh, phrase, you know, a mechanism for reviewing planning options because I realise that um, although we have um, the relative flexibility that virtual governance affords us, we're also under a lot of emotional pressure at the moment and demand, so it may not be possible logistically to organise a board meeting, so it may be that that, that engagement takes place uh, in another way. So I'm going to uh, try and use this webinar software better than I have in previous webinars and open the uh, poll and I can see that 74% of you, the overwhelming majority, uh, are planning to meet now that the guidance is published uh, and 17% of you uh, expect that that will happen, even though you don't exactly know when. And only um, a combined total of 9% of you uh, are either not expecting to uh, be engaged actively in the process or don't know. So that's encouraging for me to see that uh, the overwhelming majority of you are ready uh, and willing to uh, stand with and alongside your school leaders in this very important phase. And for those of you who are not sure or, or just don't know, uh, I would encourage you to find out, even if that's just a friendly inquiry to your chair of the governing board or your clerk, um, as, to, as to what will be happening at board level to support this very important and demanding process. And that's a very reasonable question, given the level of accountability and responsibility that boards have. So I'm talking to an audience, the majority of whom will be having these uh, very important conversations over the next three weeks. So that's good for me to know. Uh, and Molly, if it's okay, I'm, I'm gonna close uh, this bit on my software now. Uh, Molly's closed the, close the poll, I'm sure. And uh, I'm going to move on to my next uh, slide, really. Uh, and I'll just do that by navigating the software. And that's, Moving on to actually what, what we are scrutinising, what we're assessing and planning for, uh, a bit more about what's in the what's in the guidance. And I'm, I'm going to pick up my notes at this stage. So I was scribbling a few things down before uh, this webinar started. And you know, just think about how we would best describe this um, this process. And you know, I wrote down a, a logistical balancing act for school leaders, and I think that's a fairly uh, decent way of putting it. Because on, on the one hand, um, we are looking uh, to bring all our pupils uh, back. And on the other hand, um, we're trying to do that within the com confines of, of keeping uh, a reasonable social distance between people uh, in limited space. But we're also, and what the guidance is very clear about, uh, being told that actually we shouldn't put um, measures in the way of bringing pupils back. So it's a logistical um, balancing act here. How do we how do we maintain uh, social distancing uh, as as we understand it to be, and run a school at the same time? And so I'm going to start uh, this this conversation 
about scrutiny of risk and, and, and planning with, with that principle of minimising contact and maintaining social distancing in schools because the national conversation has taken place of this, has, about this has been focused on how it's possible to return to full capacity and reduce the risk of, uh, of transmission through social contact, as I've said. But the guidance, when you get a chance to read it, advises that schools go about this by sticking to an overarching principle. And that overarching principle is to reduce the number of contacts between children and staff. And they do that uh, at the, as best they can in their circumstances. So put simply, the guidance is permissive, not prescriptive. And what the government is doing is strongly recommending that social distancing is maintained as best as it possibly can be, if I put that correctly, but it's not enforcing social distancing measures in schools. That's a really important point to make when you're thinking about um, how and what, or the art of what is possible uh, in your individual schools. You're actually looking at an overarching principle here uh, and how you actually go about achieving it uh, is taking the advice that's in the, in, in the guidance, but using the flexibility the guidance affords you to make it work as well and as safely as, uh, as, as, possi as possibly as you can. So let's, let's look, shall we, at some of the health and safety risk assessment system of control uh, considerations and, and school leaders will want to take the board through, through all of these and how they're refreshing their risk assessment to take them into account. And this is a process you, you'll be familiar with because you've already been through the, uh, the scrutiny of risk associated with bringing more pupils back um, up, until, up until this point. Uh, but the risk assessment is very important. It's a legal requirement we, uh, we have as employers to uh, carry out risk assessment and mitigate for the risks that those, those assessments uh, present us with. So it shouldn't be uh, trivialised in any way, but nevertheless, it's something that's it, it, it's ongoing. And, and many of the control systems will, will already be in place in your school in some form. Um, and you'll want to discuss how they're being adapted or scaled up, if you like. Um, to uh, fit this requirement to uh, return at full capacity. So what I'm going to do on this slide is really gloss over minimising contact with individuals who are unwell, uh, you know, keeping people away and, and sending them home if they have symptoms, because you'll you, you probably had those conversations and you're familiar with that uh, as, as, a con as a concept. I'll, I'll gloss over uh, contact tracing and, and isolation as a, as a principle because uh, requesting people uh, displaying systems uh, symptoms to isolate again is a concept concept you're 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 probably more familiar with and the robust hygiene and cleaning procedures which are absolutely um, essential uh, and will be will remain essential and, and, and will need to be uh, followed to ensure that the risk of transmission is reduced but nevertheless, those things will already be in place at a pretty strong level in your school and trust. So it's just a question of actually how you're adapting them and scaling them up uh, in, alongside the advice that you've been given to ensure that you can bring people, all people back at full capacity and, um, and, and keep them safe. So those things I'll, I'll probably uh, gloss over because really it's it, some, some of the other things that perhaps may be less have featured less in your conversations at board level up till now. Maybe they, maybe they have, uh, such as in, engaging with test and trace. Um, the, the, the advice is uh, covers how you should have a system for engaging with test and trace uh, and, and, and setting out your expectations um, that staff and, and, and parents and pupils who develop uh, symptoms will get a test uh, and they act on the result. So that's it in broad terms, your risk assessment and your systems of control should ensure that those procedures um, are in place. Um, you should also have procedures in place to, to cover uh, local outbreaks as well. And, and you'll be advised by your local health protection teams on that. So you'll be informed by your local advice on, on what to do. 
Um, but you'll all, it will require the school to be light on its feet as well. So if you suddenly had to shut down or, or, or shut down part of the school, um, how, how could you deal um, with that uh, in a way that doesn't impact on the education? You know, could you switch quickly to remote working? How would you um, help and support those vulnerable pupils and staff? So whilst there might be a local framework uh, for, for outbreaks uh, or, or, or particular issues in your school, um, you need to be light on your feet and have some kind of contingencies in place to deal with those scenarios. So again, at board level, those board level, that board level, those board level conversations that you're going to be having over the next three weeks, these kind of topics will feature in those conversations. I, I, I would expect, and you'll be looking for assurance that these solutions have been thought through as best they can. That you can rather know now that you know what's in the guidance and deciding the best way to minimise contact and mixing in school. Well, contact and mixing are actually two separate things, and I did mean to. Um, actually separate them on the slide earlier uh, because they are social distancing and, and, and groups. Uh, we know uh, and we've heard that the, the response um, to that in the advice, and these are concepts we're familiar with, is that pupils will stay together and move around together in groups, in bubbles as they're known, and the size uh, of those bubbles will depend obviously on the type and school and the phase of school, and indeed in, 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 in terms of what is logistically possible. So that is the way um, that in principle, uh, you will minimize mixing between groups is by keeping them uh, in bubbles. Minimizing contact is a social distancing aspect, and that is uh, doing your best uh, to keep adults two meters apart uh, from, from everyone. Um, but accepting that that not is, is not going to be possible um, all the time because of the nature of your provision, particularly if you have young or vulnerable children, the guidance accepts that and recognises that. So then you're looking at actually other, uh, other measures that, that reinforce uh, the health and safety aspects, like the, the one metre rule uh, most of the time and, and not being uh, having face-to-face -face contact with people for more than 15 minutes, if I remember the guidance correctly. But again, as I said earlier, these are permissive uh, recommendations and it's permissive advice for you to apply in your own context. Uh, and that's, that's a very important uh, point to make. So you'll be going through all of those things in the next three weeks uh, with, your, with your school leaders at that meeting, and they will unlock uh, the wider planning considerations uh, associated with that. And the guidance uh, refers to staggered starts and adjusting uh, start and finish times. And I know there's a little bit of scepticism about how this is logistically possible. Um, but we also know that the principle behind it is to keep groups um, separate on the way out uh, and on the way into school. Uh, way into school and also keep them as, uh, apart on the streets and, and on public uh, on, on, on public transport. Remote education provision uh, is absolutely essential uh, as part of the contingency and the flexible scenario planning because it may well be the case that you have to switch to remote education for pupils uh, who can't be in school uh, because uh, of their health circumstances, or indeed uh, because uh, the school uh, has to close or partially close due to local circumstances. So the strength and the flexibility of the school's online learning provision will be key in maintaining that continuity of education. And we've all been, haven't we, to use that terrible phrase, on a bit of a journey with this over, over the last few months in, in understanding and developing uh, in some cases, almost from scratch, uh, remote education provision, and, and, and you know that, that has varied in, in different parts of the country. The approach to that, and it, and the government is recognising um, uh, this as an issue. And obviously, you have read about the investment in the Oak National Academy and the online learning materials uh, that will continue to be added to over the summer. 
uh, and the government's also doing work with the BBC and other providers to ensure that remote education options for schools are greater in more depth and, and meet the flexibilities and the demands of your own uh, ambitious curriculum. So that's very important too, uh, that you have uh, those, things, um, those things in place. Um, so then we're also talking about the, the constraints placed on uh, dedicated uh, and public transport. Uh, and that will be working with providers uh, that, to provide dedicated transport for your pupils, significant issue for uh, schools that provide uh, support for complex needs who rely on that type of transport. What can you do to maintain those over overarching principles that I referred to a few moments ago um, with your dedicated transport providers? And the same uh, applies to public transport uh, and, and obviously that's perhaps a more local uh, strategic response to that. But of course, on the ground, uh, the, the department and the government is recommending that, uh, you know, we encourage and promote where possible walking to school, cycling to school uh, and the use of private transport. So that will be one of your wider uh, planning considerations as well. And the other three, the other uh, items on the, on the slide there, are really linked to thinking about and listening to the concerns and communicating uh, the steps that your schools are taking. Uh, because however flexible uh, your plans are, uh, it's people who will make them work. It's their cooperation, their goodwill, their understanding and their confidence that will make these plans work. So how you're reaching out to them, how you're explaining, how you're listening to their concerns, how you're addressing, particularly our vulnerable groups, those groups who we know the data tells us are more vulnerable to COVID and will perhaps have that additional fear and anxiety about being in uh, an environment with more people, which perhaps they haven't been in for a while. These are, these, these are things we need to think about in our wider planning considerations and reaching, reaching out uh, over that. So th those are the very acute and, and clear issues that are raised in the guidance that we will feature in our governing board planning considerations over the next uh, few weeks. And so moving on, um, I'd like to talk about the recovery phase, and I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this, but I think it's important to, to cover it um, because how governing boards, uh, I, I know everyone is keen uh, on, lab not everyone is keen on labelling this as a recovery phase, by the way, uh, but if you don't like the label, you'll recognise that it's, it's that coming back from COVID is not as simple as picking up from, uh, from where we left off in March. We all recognise that. So we're going to have to reframe our own approach and strategic uh, short to medium term strategic priorities to reflect that. And um, the way uh, I'd like to sort of phrase this, and, and this is with uh, acknowledgement to Andy Meller from Schools Advisory Service, who wrote a really good article in this month's uh, Governing Matters. Uh, those of you who've not had a chance to read that, I recommend that you do. Um, he he really, I think, um, got to the heart of this and said that, you know, it's more important than ever as schools and boards that we live our values, we live and, and we resist the pressure to just rush back and try and fill the gaps in learning um, uh, that, that we think have occurred before we truly understand the impact of COVID on our pupils, not just in learning terms, but in social and emotional terms as well. So I think there are three overlapping phases of the recovery stage and our short term strategic priorities will be framed around these three overlapping phases. That's assessing our physical and mental health and well-being. Where, where do we need to concentrate our efforts? Who will need the extra support? Finding out about the lost learning and, and uh, that we need to, to help our pupils recover alongside the certainty of getting back into school life and then meeting those needs through the deployment of resources and perhaps doing things differently than we anticipated if we were working to a, a, a regular two or three year school improvement um, cycle. So those three overlapping phases I think will form the basis of, of, your, of your plans, uh, your short term reframing of strategic priorities. And just to go through those briefly uh, on the physical and mental health, well, and well-being aspects, um, 
you know, that things that have things that we've experienced during COVID uh, that will need to be taken into account, whether that's bereavement, sadly, or isolation, or just uh, the, the the stress and shock to pupils of being together with their family units. You know, pretty much um, in a in their own sort of uh, bubble, to use that uh, term again for for a long period of time, and then suddenly having to get back into school life. That's that's not going to be easy. So. We need to think about assessing how how we best meet those needs and rebuild social engagement, encouraging our pupils and staff to reach out and seek support where they need. And then all the things that we can do, uh, whether it's activities or initiatives to encourage them uh, to restore themselves to full health and restorative powers, you know, whether that's getting more sleep, eating properly, exercise that reintroduces us back into this post COVID world. So there may be strategic priorities that the board has short term and school leaders that are built around those things. Linking to uh, the gradual assessment of, of learning, lead, learning needs. And this is a formative process and it, it, it's going to take time. Your, your, your staff will be observing pupils, talking to them, scrutinising their work, uh, whilst uh, avoiding and introducing unnecessary uh, tracking systems. The guidance is is quite clear about that. That's not that's that's not necessary. So, as a governing board, you'll be supporting and trying to understand better how your school leaders and schools will be approaching this, how they're going to how their approach and their their system and routine for identifying those gaps in knowledge and skills, and how they're going to how they're going to be addressed through a broad and, and balanced uh, curriculum, because. You know, we're, we're at pains to state that um, deciding um, how the curriculum will be delivered to make up for the lost learning time is the way to go rather than changing timetables and trying to create a recovery curriculum that perhaps has that counterintuitive effect of narrowing um, the broad and balanced aspect that, that, that chimes with our vision and what we want our children to have left our schools knowing and being. So it's again, another one of those balancing acts that we'll find ourselves performing over the next uh, few months. And it's really important you engage with your school leaders in those strategic conversations about how that's gonna be achieved. What, what, what can we have as success criterion for that? What can we, um, how can we measure that as a, as a governing board and monitor that in a meaningful way that, that helps support and challenge you, school leaders and staff, to do it well, um, albeit in very difficult circumstances. And then making a success of, uh, of meeting those needs, you know, whether it's supporting uh, and, and reintegrate, reintegrating pupils into school, overcoming barriers to attendance. Some pupils will feel very uncomfortable about coming back to school. I'm not supporting the narrative about fines, uh, which which has which has been going around the media. Absolutely um, understand what's been said uh, by the Secretary of State, but I also trust our school leaders to take the right proportionate approach using the discretion that's afforded to them by law. So I think that's a uh, something that I know governing boards will will encourage as well. Uh, implementing the the catch-up support, the funding, you know, not just the, the catch-up money that we get, but our pupil premium funding in the best way, so that those who need it most are given all the support they need to help them uh, reintegrate into school life and, and, and to recover their lost learning and achieve their full potential. That may involve, or is likely to involve, prioritising teaching time and certain subjects rather than, you know, completely dropping others. I've already remember already mentioned the remote education aspects of that, but that's going to be crucial and fundamental, as are the pastoral systems. So again, you'll be thinking as governing boards about short-term strategic priorities that are linked to those things and some success criteria around that and, and how you can monitor those things in a meaningful way that makes up for, um, you know, perhaps the lack of data uh, that, that, you're, that you're used to working with and a lack of, uh, you know, tangible, quantitative uh, information uh, that's not at your disposal now. Uh, which brings me on uh, to the topic of governance uh, from September. And in all probability, it won't just go back 
to how it was before lockdown. I don't know about you, but I'm not expecting uh, as a governor and a trustee uh, to be in school, probably in the first half of the autumn term. I may not be, I may be wrong about that, but we'll, we'll wait and see. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I'm going to encourage my governing board and, and, and use the support of my clerk um, to have those professional conversations about new ways of working and, and, and learning from this experience. So, you know, is there an opportunity to combine our virtual meetings with meetings in school so we get the best of both worlds, the engagement and the convenience uh, that, that comes with virtual meetings? Uh, how do we do that at the same time as remaining compliant and, 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 and lawful? Um, making sure that our professional and organisational matters are taken care of because many of those have been on hold during this period and some will need to be picked up uh, in, in, at the right time in the right way. And it may be that we have to adopt our governing board ways of working, maybe short to medium term at least, to fit that, uh, to fit that approach. And that could be you know, a slightly different committee structure, for example, um, and, and combining visits to school with remote monitoring meetings uh, with staff, depending on you know, what social distancing allows us to do. So it's a time to start those conversations in your own context and explore your possibilities. And I know that many of you have, and it was a really brilliant and informative conversation that took place on UK Governor Chat about these things uh, over the weekend. And it's good that, 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 that people are thinking uh, in, in these terms. And, and, and the final point I wanted to make there, and that's why I have it in red as a reminder to me, is about local governance in maps, because many governing boards uh, and many trusts rather have suspended their local governance arrangements during this period and that is uh, with understandable reason to provide some sort of continuity and cohesion it may well be the case actually that um, you have plans to reinstate your local governance but we would very much encourage mats um, to think about that now if they haven't because i think you'll need those local eyes and ears on the ground more than ever uh, at this time as we're winning hearts and minds and building confidence and working with people. So from NGA's perspective, we think it's absolutely important that Matt's start thinking very carefully about their engagement with the local tier and what that means uh, in this post-September phase. So plenty for us to think about as governing boards in terms of the way we work. But there are things, regardless of, of the direction that takes us, that we, that we want to hold on to. That, the first of it is our strategic thinking, um, not to lose sight of our vision. Uh, things may and will look different for the time being, but we have a vision for what we want for our pupils. And so all our short term strategic priorities should be framed around that. Uh, and we need to look after our leaders and our staff and give them the thinking time too. So, you know, be kind to your school leaders. I know you are, there's been some tremendous support that, that you've given over this time, but it's important to maintain that. Uh, and health and well-being, we know will be one of the biggest issues uh, for us as employers over this next phase. So stay strategic, keep thinking about how everything we're doing in the short term links back to our vision. And even though we might not have the same amount or type of information that we've had prior to March as we gradually rebuild, the concept of triangulation still very much remains important and, and, and valid. So the information that we get from senior executive leaders and we'll be asking them about what they can reasonably provide, given what they know, will be, will be important to us, um, as will the external sources that we rely on. Maybe they'll be adapted um, to, to the circumstances as well. And then what we see with our own eyes, whether that's through visits, when they can safely and properly be achieved, at, or, or through some kind of remote engagement or a blending of the both. You know, the virtual governance means still means visible governance and, and NGA is very keen to resume its vision, visible governance campaign when the time is right. And we've not lost sight of how just how important that is and how important it is to be, to be visible as governors. So don't hang on to those things and those concepts, even if school and governance for you will look a little bit different uh, from September. So hopefully, that has provided you with the aid memoir that you need for those conversations up until the end of term and indeed uh, at the beginning of next term. So what I'm going to do now is just 
um, dive into a couple of your questions and say to you that I knew I would run significantly over um, during this um, webinar. Uh, and I hope that you've been, at, you, you know, you felt that was worth me bearing, bearing with me. Um, so these questions, I will read a couple out, but I promise I will get back to everyone and share the frequently asked ones through NGA's guidance and frequently asked questions uh, uh, function. So I'm going to uh, ask, I'll answer a couple of those. A nice quick one to answer there. Steve, you've just mentioned UK Governor uh, Chat. What is this? Uh, well, it's a fantastic virtual community that comes together on a on a Sunday uh, to discuss issues of governing governance and governing practice. And, um, and if you're on social media, you and, and follow them. Follow UK Governor Chat on Twitter. Uh, you can you you can link in with that online discussion. And uh, you know, I very much recommend uh, that you do that. So that's a nice uh, underarm question there, which I've I've just answered there. It's a nice gentle one to start with. Um, how do we ensure that the catch-up funding uh, gets to everyone who needs it? Great question. Gives me an opportunity to say that the Education Endowment Fund, uh, fund has published guidance on how to make the best use of the funding that you receive uh, and ensure that it impacts most on those who need it. So I think the first, um, first port of call there is a conversation with your school leader, strategic conversation with your school leader, with informed by the education endowment uh, fund advice, which is freely available, and perhaps we'll send the link to that along with the slides uh, for this for this webinar. Um, I'm acutely aware of the time now. I may have even actually broken the record. I didn't want to for running over uh, the the allotted time, but um, this is such an important topic, and it's so important that we stand by our school leaders and uh, at this time, at this really important time. Uh, and very challenging time to, to try and, and achieve this full return uh, to capacity, which is so important for the country and so important for our children, uh, but doing it safely is as, if not more important. So it's a balancing act. We all need to support each other. We all need to stand by each other and we all need to test each other's assumptions and plans and not just be guided by what we read and. And, and, and what's filtered through about the guidance and what it does and doesn't say. So use, your, use these opportunities, use these next three weeks to really get behind your school leaders and work with them uh, as a team to build the confidence and the plans that can achieve this full return so we, schools can be what we really want them to be from September, which is full of kids. That's why we govern uh, and that's what motivates us to do it. And I'm, I've really am out of time now so all i'm going to do actually in uh, in thanking you is just remind you that if you do have specific questions um then you can i'm just going to go to my next slide you can still contact our advice service that's open to all governing boards for the remainder of this academic year or to the beginning of september so if you have any specific concerns about the guidance or questions about the guidance and how to apply it do um speak to one of our Goldline advisors. We'll be updating our own preparing uh, for September guidance uh, again early next week. So do look out for that and, and stay in touch with it. Uh, and, and hopefully that will answer a few more of the questions I haven't been able to uh, go into and pick the detail of. But I hope at the very least I provided you with a, with a fairly useful aid memoir that will shape those discussions over, over the next few weeks. So thank you for bearing with me. Thank you for joining me. Thank you as always for what you do. It's an absolute privilege to support you. You know, I don't say that lightly. Uh, it's, it, is, it is a real privilege. Uh, whatever you're doing this weekend, enjoy it. If you're getting a haircut like I am, then uh, enjoy that. And uh, I look forward to joining you again at a future NGA webinar. Thank you very much and goodbye.